Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Let's bow our heads and pray just for a moment. God, thank you for the power of your wonderful cross. Thank you for the awe and wonder that we stand in today to know that you can take things so awful, something as brutal as the cross, Lord, and make it good and beautiful to us today. And I just pray that you would just expose that kind of glory and hardship through your word today as we follow your servant Moses and his wrestle with trying to do what you called him to do, Lord. And I just pray that your spirit would be in this place. I pray that your word would speak with power and authority, Lord, and just move us into alignment with heaven. That we would just be able to worship you in the way that we receive what you have to say, God as we're just inspired by all that you have done. We give you praise, God, that you've given us this word to be able to know who you are and who you've always been. So just testify of yourself today, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Welcome to week three of our Delivered series. This is kind of an unusual take on Christmas. We like to think of it a little bit as a prequel we are looking back at Israel's very first deliverer and walking alongside all of the ways that God has been exposing what we're going to be celebrating here in just a few weeks with the coming of our deliverer, Jesus. And last week, Moses encountered the burning bush. This is a very famous encounter in scripture. This is where God places this holy call on Moses to go before Pharaoh, bringing the word of the Lord and saying to let his people go. And as Matt laid out, Moses had some objections to this calling. He had some excuses, and the Lord and Moses just kind of go back and forth in this moment for a little while, finally landing with God, telling Moses to take his brother Aaron with him as that help and to be able to still go before. And so last week's message was entitled, Called. This week, it is called Sent. This is where we're going to see Moses go and fulfill what he has been asked by God to do. So we're going to be wrapping up a few of those last little verses in chapter 4, and then we're going to be making our way through chapter 5 and some of 6 today, if you want to be following along in your Bible. Moses has finally, it seems a little bit reluctantly, agreed to do what God has called him to and bring Moses, and so he, um, I'm sorry, Moses meets up with Aaron, and so this kind of happens towards the end of chapter 4. He meets with Aaron, he says, this is what God has told me to do. Look at these. He shows him the signs and the wonders that God has given him the power to do. And then um, the two of them kind of get together. So in chapter 4, verse 29, it says this. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of, Is of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down. And worshipped. And I can't imagine what kind of a moment this must have been, not only for Moses and Aaron, but Israel, as they are gathering the people together and they're saying, listen, after hundreds of years of us being enslaved, the Lord has given me a word that I'm to go before Pharaoh and command that we be let go to go and freely worship our God. And he proves that God is the one who's ordained this by showing these signs and wonders. And these people are realizing, it says, they heard the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery. And so their response naturally is worship. God cares. He's heard. He's going to do something about this. And so Moses and Aaron have got to be thinking, okay, you know, as a people, God is about to do something so awesome. We get to be a part of this. And I'm sure this was a huge, just power filled with the Holy Spirit type moment as they get ready to go before Pharaoh. And so they do that at the top of chapter 5. It says, afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. 
And check this out. This is kind of a perfect case study on what happens when you try to enforce God's word upon someone who does not know God. Sometimes I feel like this is something we do on social media a lot. You will see an influencer or someone who is very popular, well-known, not a Christian, and often you will find Christians in the comments saying, you shouldn't be doing that, you should be acting this way, this is what the Bible says. And the fact is, that person does not care because they do not know God. They do not understand who he is, and so therefore their, his word does not hold the same kind of authority in their heart. And so I would encourage you that you are losing a, uh, you're fighting a losing battle if you are trying to behavior manage people without first helping them to know Jesus. That's what they have to understand because if you throw commandments and actions at them without them understanding who God is, they are not going to be responsive to that. So whether it's your kids or your friends or whoever, trying to correct their behavior using God's word is futile if they don't know God. Because obedience to the word is produced by trust in the author. I heard a really great example of this one time, and I think I actually used it before. It was I was listening to, um, it's called The Unashamed Podcast. It's a bunch of the guys from Duck Dynasty. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. They've actually got a lot more wisdom than you would realize hiding behind those beards. But um, one of them was sharing this analogy that he often uses of if you got a text message, and we often do from numbers that we don't recognize, if you got a text message and it said, hey, come and meet me at McDonald's from an anonymous message, you're going to be like, well, I'm not going anywhere because I don't know this person and this is probably not a safe situation. So you're gonna completely ignore it. And they're gonna be like, hey, it's really great. There's this really great thing. We're gonna have a great conversation. You've gotta meet me. You're thinking, this is getting creepier and creepier. I don't know this person or why they're telling me to go and do these things. And so you're gonna ignore it. But when you get a text message from your best friend saying, hey, meet me at McDonald's. It's on me. We're gonna have a great conversation. It's gonna be a great day. You're like, Okay, I mean, you're gonna probably move your schedule around to go and meet that person. And it's the same way when we know the author, we're going to respond with trust. We're gonna be more inclined to listen to what that person has to say, especially when it's God. And this is where I would encourage you in your witnessing to people who do not follow Christ, instead of spending so much time trying to get them to obey him, invest your time in helping them get to know him. And what happens at that point, if they're really getting to know our living God, Jesus Christ, obedience is going to follow. Because when you understand that he is so worthy to be listened to, he is worthy to be followed naturally, that is the inclination of your heart. That's where conviction comes in. And his nature, I believe, I will stand on this today, his nature is that compelling. So if you're exposing people to the presence and the very nature of God, you are going to get to see that change, the fruit of the spirit, that transformation. And the more that they know him, the more that they're going to listen to him. And that's where that fear of the Lord comes in, that wisdom comes in, the trust comes in. That's where relationship comes in. But Pharaoh here, he does not have relationship with this God. He does not have the fear of the Lord. So he's like, no, why would I listen to a God I don't know? You're here telling me this is what God is saying. I don't know him, I don't care what he has to say, continue to get your work done. And so he gets irritated. He's like, this, this whole thing you're throwing at me, this narrative of going to worship your God, it's stopping people from working. So please get out of my face and go and get back to work. And so in verse six, it says that same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. He said, you are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. And that is why they're crying out, go and sac we're gonna go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for these people so that they keep working and they pay no attention to lies. He said, make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention. Pharaoh is gonna make sure that God's people are so bogged down that they cannot possibly get swept up in this new idea of freedom that's going around. And this is an age old tactic that you will see in your life. The enemy wants you overwhelmed 
stressed, bogged down, and so consumed with hopelessness that you will pay no attention to what God is doing in your midst. And the devil will fill your life with so much hardship and distraction, sometimes it's even good things, that you will forget what God has said. And you will even become resentful toward what God has said because it's gotten so much harder to carry this. And this is what happens to the Israelites now as a result. As Pharaoh's slave drivers make the workload that much more difficult on these Hebrew workers, they begin beating them and saying, why aren't you getting it done? Why aren't you getting it done? Even though they've added another layer for them to have to work on, without the resources needed to meet it, they begin to become resentful towards what Moses and Aaron got them all excited about before they went to go see Pharaoh. In verse 20, it says, when the Israelite overseers left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh, and his officials have put swords in their hands to kill us. They're like, you did this. You made it worse. We've been worshiping, we're all excited, now you've done this, you have made it so much harder on us. We're getting beat more, we have a higher expectation on us, we are completely downtrodden. If you hadn't gone and said what you did to Pharaoh, we wouldn't be in this mess. And I just can't imagine what this moment must have felt like for Moses. It says in verse 22 that Moses returned to the Lord after they've berated him like this and, and condemned him and said, may the Lord judge you, he says, he says to God, why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he brought trouble on this people. And you've not rescued your people at all. He's like, God, why did you do this? I did what you said. And you know what happened? It made everything worse. God, you brought me here. I wasn't even in Egypt. I was safe in Midian. You brought me here, and now they hate me. My people hate me. I told them that you would do signs and wonders, and now they've only had trouble and more work. I told them you would rescue them. You haven't rescued them at all. Is this why you sent me, to make a bigger mess? Because that's where I'm at right now, Lord. You guys remember when David was invited to play music for King Saul? And he was, he was supposed to come in and be able to calm Saul's spirit. That's why he got invited in the first place. But that very same gift that was able to calm Saul eventually turned him completely irate to the point of wanting to kill David. Or that time that Joseph, God gave Joseph such a beautiful dream and he told his brothers, how'd that go? Not real well. <laughs> he got sold into slavery because of it. And he's gotta be thinking, God, what is going on? Or do you remember when Job, God saw Job as so faithful that God personally wrote a letter of recommendation to the devil to attack him. This is where faithfulness gets us. And this is the most refining reality of having faith. It's accepting that sometimes God makes the situation harder on purpose. And I don't know about you, but that does not sit well with me most of the time. Because from our moral vantage point, it feels like every prayer that we ask should have an immediate relief to it. That that should be the result of prayer every time, but it's just not always the case. In fact, sometimes it's the very intention of God that things get harder before they get better. Remember what I read, but even before we got started today, I just want to plant that seed with you in chapter four, verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So God told Moses he was gonna do this. God intended from the beginning that at first Moses was going to say no. God meant that the first answer was not going to be yes. And as we learned in our Joseph series, what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. And so God has promised some things to you. But for some of you, he's ordained the journey to be very challenging on purpose. 
And I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say because it's not in your notes, but I believe it's a crucial word for some of you. What will be revealed and fortified during the challenge will only enrich the promise. What will be revealed and fortified during the challenge you're walking through will only enrich the promise. And that's something you have to hold on to, that God is being intentional. So don't be discouraged when God has set the fulfillment of his promise to you on the other side of great challenge because you are blessed that he would select you for such a thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but praise the Lord, not destroyed. It says in verse 15, all this is for your benefit. Hard to imagine that, right? Being perplexed, persecuted, struck down. He says, all of this is for your benefit so that the grace of God is reaching more and more people and it may cause thanksgiving to overflow to what? To the glory of God. So he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. And this is my favorite. This is just such an incredible verse of scripture. I hope you just write down here. Verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So at the top of chapter six, then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of what? Because of my mighty hand, he said. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. He's saying, Pharaoh will be so done with them because of what I'm going to do. He's going to drive them out. God also says to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have, here's that word, we've seen this a lot over the last few months, I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession because I am who I am the the Lord. The Lord's covenant, we've been hearing that word over the last couple series, this covenant of freedom he points to here is beyond just freedom from enslavement in Egypt, but he is pointing to the fulfillment of his covenant to Abraham. This is the fulfillment we're going to be celebrating together right here on December 24th, the the birth of Jesus. And I just want to give you a little plug because I hope you can join us to be here to celebrate the fulfillment. We get to live out what God just said to Moses. It has happened and we are living in the realities of this. So we have services at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. where we are going to be celebrating. And spoiler alert, Jesus is the ultimate answer to God's covenant. He is the true deliverer of Israel and the world. But here in this moment of Moses' questioning and doubt, God has not forgotten what he said. 
It is still written on his heart and on his mind, and he has not lost sight of his timing and purpose and plan for one second, even though on Moses' end of all of this, on his side of the unfulfillment of the covenant, he is feeling pretty unstable. God knows what he said, and he's not forgotten. Not only this covenant that he's made to Moses, but the one that he has made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The plan hasn't changed. The promise hasn't changed just because the journey has become harder than expected. Because the reality of our God, Jehovah, is that he always keeps his word. And he's faithful to remind us of who he is. That was something that he kept saying all throughout these verses. He said, Moses, I am the Lord. I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. If there's nothing he takes away from everything that he said about covenant and about I'm gonna drive uh, drive us out of Egypt, I'm gonna do these things, he makes sure the thing that he says the most frequently is who he is, I am the Lord. And so Moses, in verse nine, returns around and reports this to the Israelites. But they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. I just want to confess today that that, I just saw myself in this verse. Like how often do I not listen to what God is trying to tell me because I'm so busy being so discouraged? Am I alone in that? Does anyone else ever struggle with that? You're so busy or hurting or discouraged or just feeling like upon God's first act, that he's clearly not answering the prayer and so we just get so stuck on the lack of answering that as, he, as he's trying to communicate, he's trying to show his love and his presence and his plan that we just don't listen. Then in uh, verse 10, the Lord responds to Moses. He says, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. So he's like, all right, you're going again. Go tell him. And Moses says to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, so the Israelites, they're not listening to me, why would Pharaoh, the king, listen to me since I apparently speak with faltering lips? And so what has Moses done? He has immediately internalized the rejection of this word from Israel, and he has said, see, I told you, I told you at the bush that I'm not a good communicator. I've already messed this up. They're not listening to me. So now I'm supposed to go back to Pharaoh and say, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go. My people won't even listen to me. How am I I supposed to make this happen? And this is how we all are. God gives us assignments bigger than us, and we get hesitant, we get insecure, we get discouraged, we get afraid, and we take everything as confirmation of our insecurities. And Moses is just one example of the fact that everyone who is called by God must learn the art of serving while scared. You can't wait until you feel like you're enough to do what he's called you to do. You can't hold off until you become some more courageous version of yourself to take a step in following Jesus. You can't afford to let fear Dictate your moves in the kingdom of God when he has so much in store for you. If God has put someone in your path to reach, you've got to reach them. If God has elevated you to a place of leadership in your workplace, you've got to lead. That wasn't on accident. If God's allowed you to be the first one to become a Christian in your family, it's you that's got to be that example. If God has given you kids or loved ones to speak truth into, you've got to speak. He's given you that role. And all of this, maybe some of this is tugging at you like, that's me, and you're just sitting here scared to death this morning. Sometimes you just got to do it scared. Because this life, this life we're in now, this side of heaven, this is a vapor. And the kingdom of God is at hand, and the Lord has a purpose for you. You and you and you and you and you and you to make an impact on this world starting exactly where you are, even if you're afraid. Acts 7.35 says, this is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? 
This is the guy sent to be ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He's got people who are like, who are you to be ruler and judge? But this is the guy that God's like, this is the one I pick. And he had already been rejected and driven out of Egypt by the judgment of these people before God even said, I pick you to be the one to be their mouthpiece. And so now Moses is thinking, I'm an outcast. I'm not a leader. I'm not a good communicator. I've already told you guys that. I've got sin in my past. I've murdered somebody. These are all the things that's gotta be going through his head. And look, now I've already tried once. I've gone to Pharaoh. I said something to him and it didn't work. I made everything worse. Nobody's listening to me. Pharaoh doesn't listen. These guys don't listen. I'm just not it. God, God must have messed up picking me. I'm not the guy. And if you are in your Moses moment today, having doubt about what God's called you to do or how able or equipped you might be to do it, I believe that God is speaking the same thing over you and into you today that he spoke to Moses. He says, I am the Lord. My mighty hand is what is going to work. I am going to lift the burden off of your shoulders. In your weakness, I am strong. I will bring you what I promised. And he's saying, now go and do what I sent you for. Would you stand? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your mercy that you would invite us to be a part of your plan. It's just beautiful, Lord. We look at, at Moses and all of the things that he just had stacked against him, God, and the guilt of his past, the, the fear of, of not being a good communicator, Lord, all of the insecurities that he had, Lord, and just feeling like a failure, feeling like after that first try, it didn't work, Lord. And I don't know how you've been working in these people's lives, Lord, but maybe they've been trying to serve you and it just feels like it's not working. They haven't been able to get free from the addiction or they haven't been able to thoroughly or effectively witness to that person you've put in their lives. Maybe it feels like their family's falling apart, their marriage is falling apart. And it feels like what you told them isn't true because you've made the journey hard. I pray God that you would just put a new deposit of faith in them today to hold on to you and to trust that you are fortifying them, that you are enriching the promise through the hardship that you are allowing them to walk through right now, God. And you are faithful to walk through it with them every step of the way, Lord. And as we just open up our altars and respond to you, Lord, if there's just anybody who needs to just come and sit and choose to re-believe you, I pray that they would have the courage to do that today, God, because you are working, you are faithful, and you are awesome and goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. So we will go wherever you send us, Lord. So speak clearly today as we respond. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.